Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to our uh, second uh, webinar on data uh, and technology, data and technology in natural, natural intelligence. Um, with me, uh, my co-host to, tonight is uh, Chaya. I'm uh, Amichai Zoykavo, the chief architect of natural, and. Uh, before we start, let me give you a couple of words about Natural. Uh, we're a global leader in multi-vertical online comparison marketplaces and our matching technology enables uh, consumers, you and me, to make confident purchasing decisions and we're helping the brands grow their business. So basically what we're doing, we're building comparison sites and we have, uh, for uh, any kind of uh, service, uh, mainly online services, and uh, we allow people like you and me make um, or take good purchase decisions. Um, we're a young company, about 400 people, profitable, uh, and uh, we have a very cool vision that we're working hard on. We want to build the platform for comparing everything. And imagine a place that you can make um, a calculated purchase decisions in hundreds and thousands of areas, practically anything you need online. And uh, this is what drives us and uh, we're building the technology uh, that supports this vision. So, uh, from day one, our company is uh, an AWS cloud um, technology uh, enabled. So uh, we've developed we've developed a lot of platforms uh, on top of of the AWS cloud for supporting our uh, multitudes of websites and content management that we need, site serving, and serving hundreds of millions of users. Uh, uh, Sorry, I said hundreds of millions, I meant millions. Uh, and uh, we're doing it with a bunch of technologies uh, for, the, for, for our website. It's gonna be Node and React and Mongo and uh, we're building a distributed content management system and for our, again, for our comparison sites and which is uh, uh, globally distributed uh, using the AWS uh, regions which is it's interesting because I'm going to dive into um, the, today's subject when we're talking about the NI data platform as part of the challenges. Um, we're doing CI CD, we're, we're, uh, we're doing microservices, containers over Kubernetes and uh, all of that to support our uh, websites and, and content management. Uh, and we're an extremely driven uh, by data. And since we're sitting in the middle between uh, a user that makes a purchase decision and a partner that sells those uh, um, products, and, and we're running uh, thousands of, of marketing campaigns uh, in order to make uh, the traffic, uh, the, use, the right users go to the right partners, uh, we have some of our traffic that starts outside of systems and the other side, the, the end of the funnel, let's call it, and outside of our system. So we have a very complex, um, let's call it data infrastructure for that. For doing all of that, we've built a data platform that we're gonna to discuss today. And uh, we're built, we've built it on a bunch of technologies, again, on the cloud using uh, Spark and, and Kafka and Kinesis and Redshift and Glue and Airflow. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we've, uh, we've done, uh, what we've built today. Um, and basically, uh, since I've said all those buzzwords, we're practically buzzword compliant. Thumbs up. Um, so this is the second installment of this webinar. The first one, in the first one, VM uh, did uh, like an intro on big data. Uh, in this one, I'm going to discuss uh, what is the data uh, platforms solution that we've built for Natural, which is uh, making it more specific to our, uh, tailoring it more specific to our use case. 
uh, next week, Chaya, which, which is co-hosting this uh, webinar with me, is going to discuss um, what we've learned building this, this data platform and data lake in the last couple of years. And there's a lot that we've learned. That we've learned. Uh, so it's going to be a dive in uh, into the transition between an old system to a new system and, uh, and uh, what are the interesting things that you, that you can uh, learn from that. Um, on the fourth installment, uh, by the way, it's going to be next week on Monday, Chaya's session, and the week after that on Sunday, uh, Daniel is going to discuss uh, a little more advanced, uh, sorry, it's going to be a VM discussing um, uh, the, some kind of a additional uh, platform that we've built uh, for doing production grade uh, applications. So how can we help users use our uh, um, data lake and data platform? And then Daniel is going to do uh, a deep dive into handling uh, complex uh, nested data. And we're going to we're going to show you how this happens and why it's needed. And pretty sure this uh, uh, five series uh, uh, web mini series of webinars is going to uh, give you a good look on the data stack that we we've built here and maybe give you some clues on how you do uh, stuff yourself. So, um, so about me, um, I've been around, I'm the chief architect for the last uh, four and a half years now in natural intelligence. Before that, I was doing uh, um, a lot of work since I think 2009. Uh, maybe 10, I was doing uh, big data things. And before that, well, practically, I put my first commercial uh, website on the web in 1997. Yeah. So I'm old. Uh, I, I don't want to say to, to, to say names, but somebody told me that he was born in 89. So what's on the menu today? Uh, we're going to talk about why do we need a data platform and what's the use cases for that and what is it? Pay attention, I'm talking about data platform, not a data lake, uh, which is part of a data platform. So I'm going to be more specific about what I'm talking about when I'm saying data platform. What's the architecture of a data platform? What do you need to know? How do you want to, uh, what kind of stuff you need to handle? When you are uh, when you're building a data platform, and how it is built, okay, a little bit dive into how it is built. It's not going to be uh, a lot of uh, deep dive into the technical aspects, uh, but uh, you can uh, you can ask questions, uh, and, and we'll we'll try to answer them. By the way, important. Um, Chaya is here with me to help uh, answer those questions. And uh, eh, Chaya, hey. Uh, and it's very important that you start typing those questions in the Q&A uh, section you have. Write them when you, when you uh, want to ask the question. If it's something that Chaya can uh, answer while I'm talking, she's going to answer that. Uh, anyway, we're going to answer at the end all the questions that, or most of the questions uh, as time permits, that we're gonna uh, get. So feel free to type those question in, questions in and uh, uh, let's, let's dive into the details here. Okay. So the data platform, um, Yogi Berra, if, if you don't know Yogi Berra, you probably start looking at this, uh, at this guy as a huge um, baseball coach and, and, and legend player. And he had, he had all of those strange sayings that kind of make sense, but almost, but I, 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 very, I, I like it very much. So you have to be careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. So 
if you have a business problem and you, and you think you need some kind of a data solution for it, take a good look at uh, what's the problem and uh, and make sure that you're going the right the right direction because uh, you might not get there. So what we had, and I, I kind of mentioned it at the intro, is uh, many websites uh, serving many users around the world. We have many partners. We have close to a thousand partners. So uh, and and people are buying and, or paying partners uh, outside our systems, of course. So we need to get data from partners. So we have many integrations uh, uh, with partners. We have a lot of marketing campaigns that were uh, driving traffic into our websites. Google, uh, Bing, Double Outbrain, you name it. We have, we have com marketing campaigns running on those platforms and we need to collect that data as well. And, uh, and it makes it uh, very important for us to collect all this data, arrange it in a, in a single place so we can learn how our system behave. We need to know if our campaigns are actually making money uh, because we're spending money. So we're sensitive to the, to the data itself and we're sensitive to the availability of, of, our, uh, of the data and of our systems. And that makes our funnel pretty complex uh, because it starts outside our system and ends outside our system. So what we figure out we, we need to build is a unified um, um, place for all the company's uh, business data to flow into, to allow us to build uh, any kind of business applications. If you take a look at the list here, the list itself is, is not very important. What's important is actually the last line. What happens in, you know, in the real world that a business person or a product person has an idea, he wants to run it, and we need to give him a, a platform to run this idea on top of. And I'm not talking about uh, a web page, I'm talking about taking data and crunching data and doing sm some smart stuff or any kind of data-driven application. And we wanted to get there. We wanted to be able to say everything you need to do, we have the platform you can run on top of. So, okay, that's a data platform. We want to run all of those specific cases and any kind of future idea that you might uh, think of. So, what is it, is it build of? So, a data platform is actually uh, a unified platform for collection, collecting, so getting the data and saving it. It has some kind of a structure. We need to need the business access, the business data to be consistent. Uh, we need to be accessible, okay? We, um, we need people to be able, people and applications, by the way, ad hoc or applicatively, need people to be able to access data, this data. And of course, this has to be uh, in a very, very, very uh, uh, cost effective and fast and of course monitored and, and with high availability. So this is the basic, uh, let's call it baseline to, uh, uh, to our uh, platform. So if you look at, uh, at the facets of a, pro a platform, uh, this is, uh, if you look at the list, this is the base things we need to do uh, in order to um, let's say, make uh, such a system uh, create. Uh, so, for example, we need to make sure the data flows uh, from our operative systems. I'm going to show you a little bit uh, how it looks, but think about it. Every system, every, every company has a bunch of complex systems that serves the users. Their main purpose is not collecting data and they're not built for crunching data, they're there, for instance, in our case, to serve websites. So uh, you need to make sure that the data that those systems are generating flows into a unified place. You need to save this, uh, this data. Uh, you need to make it, uh, of course, sa saved for a long period of time and make sure you're splitting it, the partitioning and formatting part, you make sure you, you, you wanna 
put it in the right places so it can be accessed in a, uh, uh, let's call it in a effective fashion and format it in a way that would allow effective access. So all, all of those things are a little bit behind the, let's call it the, the technological veil that you need to make sure that uh, that are in place. Um, the data needs to be standardized. Um, if we, we just throw the data, you know, data lake, everybody's talking about data lake. If you throw the data into a data lake, you, you, there's, a, there's another word out there now, there's the data swamp, okay? So you get nothing. So uh, if, if you can't find anything in it. So if you have a data lake and you wanna access it, you need to think about the structure of your data. You need to think it up front, think about it up front. Um, Now there's, uh, there's a, a couple of, of course, then the, there's the data, data access, that, that, that's the last part. And there's another one that which is a little bit, um, I'd say, uh, confusing, but uh, it's the data processing part, is that you actually want to be able to run applications of to, on top of this data, but you probably don't want to worry about the setup of those applications. Uh, so you need some kind of a mechanism that allows you to take code and run it on top of big data. and uh, all of those uh, problems are uh, clear to anyone that built a big data system. But it's uh, if you're running running a, a web server, you would have a service running your code, and that's it. In big data scenarios, it's a little bit more uh, complicated. You need some kind of a me different mechanism to handle it. Uh, so, in order to to achieve that, what you need to do is make sure to you follow, or this is the, the design principles we followed when we built our, uh, our uh, sorry, our uh, website. Um, our, let's call it data platform. It's actually sliced into two. It's making sure the data flows in. This is the event uh, driven part of the, of the system. And, uh, and the other, the other part is the data lake itself, is where you put the data and allow the access to. And the event driven part is important because you would like uh, a clear separation of concerns between systems that needs to uh, serve your clients directly. For instance, a web service or a website that needs to serve a page. And the fact that this page was served or the user clicked uh, on a button or whatever, you want to collect those uh, this information, but the minute you're trying to couple those systems together and make the uh, let's call it let's call it the online or the serving system or the back office system, the content management system, whatever you're building, start to be concerned with the needs of a data platform or data lake, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to start collecting data, and there, and we actually this is the the system that we moved from. Uh, when we built this data lake uh, or this data platform. We actually had a system that would go to a bunch of databases every once in a while, collect a lot of information, maybe some of the cases it would go to APIs, and the system was incredibly fragile. It had, if, when it went to a database, this database uh, wasn't always available. It might be um, in, a, in the middle of what kind, some kind of a deployment. If it went to an API, same thing, an API might be down. Um, if it went to, uh, to a database, it's even worse because the data itself might have changed because the database is actually the implementation detail, detail of, the, uh, of the processing system, okay, of a content management system, of a serving system. And, and there's a bunch of problems there. And uh, so you would like this split of concerns. And the best way to do that is uh, live with, a, let's say, let's call it simple rule of, I'm sending an event every time something happened, and you, you, the data platform, please take this event and put it wherever you like. I'm me as a processing system. I'm going to show you a drawing in a minute. Um, the data lake itself uh, is again a unified place. You want to put all the data together so you you can crunch it together. Even with big data today, if you have a lot of data, maybe a single database wouldn't do it anymore but with the big data technologies that we're going to discuss, you can handle a lot of data. You, but you need to be careful, this data 
still needs to be accessible. So you, we need some kind of a uh, some kind of a file level or API and or an SQL uh, access pattern to this data. So it should look like a database, but it should be bigger than database. Uh, you want to manage your data. And this is where I put in brackets a meta store. You want to say, okay, everything I do is actually um, built in some kind of a, a unified uh, um, standardized fashion, business-wise. I don't want to keep it in a unified place so I can access it in a, a consistent way, uh, manner. Uh, Data is immutable is interesting. I'm, I'm like all for making uh, sure that the data is immutable, which, mean, which means, and it's a little bit confusing for somebody that works with databases. We're used to, when you're writing to a database, you do a transaction, you change the data, everything is good. When you work with big data, it's different. You probably want to make sure your data doesn't change. And it's a little bit strange because you say, well, what do you mean doesn't strain, it change? The data change. So there's a bunch of technique. There's a bunch of techniques how to uh, still uh, handle the data as if it doesn't change. It's actually, uh, it actually means that you're probably gonna create the same replicas of the data over and over again, even if you change it. But what ha what would happen is that you never touch a file that you put on disk. You read it and you create a new file or a new version of your data. And again, with big data technologies, it's very very. Uh, very easy to do, but it's uh, a best practice. Um, and well, that's that's about it about design principle of such of a such a data platform. So, promise to your drawing. Here's a drawing. The top part is uh, uh, let's see. The top part is the back office and uh, and serving that we have today in in. Uh, in an eye, and those systems are actually sending events of everything they do. So we have, we call it dimensions events because it's configuration, what is the configuration of our systems, and list of facts events, what users did on our sites. And as I told you, this site serving part is actually um, in multitudes uh, of regions across the world. So this actually, this flow of data is actually uh, happening across uh, across the one and to a unified place down there. So everything in, in the dotted red area is the data platform. We have a mechanism or a bunch of mechanisms to help us send events, validate that, that they're okay, collect those events in an event bus, we're gonna discuss it in a minute, and make sure these data come go from the event bus into the data store so that it, they could be accessed by uh, our um, mechanisms for manipulating these data, uh, those events. Eventually, what we're gonna, uh, what we're creating is a mechanism, is a mechanism that uh, takes the events, collects them with, uh, on the side here, with integrations of data that we took from other places. I told you our funnel starts outside and ends outside, so we have integrations with partners and integrations with publishers. And all of this information with the events data that drives, that drives into our system is actually something that we want to merge. So a user visit, we want we want to know something about the campaign that it came from, and then the fact that it actually had a conversion with a partner, and uh, and we want to collect this data and allow users, analysts, applications, data scientists, whatever. Again, the, the list is endless. Access this data easily. So we have a uh, we have a data store, the place where we store the data. We have a meta store, the place where we define the dictionary that we, where we define uh, what we have. We have an access layer to access this data when we have a processing layer where we can run uh, applications. And those are the main parts of the data platforms. Event bus, store, access, uh, uh, meta store, and then a, and a processing engine. So we have data flows. Check. We have data persistence. Check. We have data standardization in the meta store. Check. We have data processing. Check. And we have data access. 
Great, we have all the, the parts that we uh, just mentioned. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the top part, the events. We actually slice them into two parts, the event bus, which is the mechanism that uh, gets the data from the serving and, and applicative part of the system, and the structure of the event. It's, it, it's, it's two different things. The, one of them is the, the mechanism, the other one is the, the way or the format where, uh, that we send uh, the data. And it's pretty important to understand that this uh, event structure uh, is actually an API. It's the contract between your uh, applications and your data lake. So this is the uh, best way to make sure that your system is, uh, uh, or that your data is consistent, okay? You have a, you have a contract. I'm uh, writing now a, a, a new application that creates a new user experience. I would send an event, and if this event has a specific contract or slash uh, structure, um, that's great. I, now I can relate to it uh, when I uh, work with the data, and if I change it, I have to change it according to uh, specific rules. We'll discuss it in a sec. So this part of the this part of the of the top part of the data platform is extremely important. It allows us to take uh, data from the from the systems and uh, and flow it inside uh, into the data store of the data lake and uh, and in a unified and consistent fashion from, from the one hand, and in a way that doesn't, uh, let's say, interfere with the uh, top system's behavior. So an event bus, the idea behind an event bus is just, okay, I'm here to collect your events. You don't need to worry about it. Just give me your data. I'm gonna make sure it gets where it needs to, to, to get. In the old days, we would write to logs or do some, local databases or whatever and then try to sync them. Today we have a bunch of technologies available for us. The main one I would say is, is Kafka. Uh, it's a glorified uh, um, write-ahead log, if you would, distributed write-ahead log. Okay, so it would get the events and write them into some kind of a persistent uh, buffer and the system that sent the event doesn't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, they're fast, they're, they're almost logicless, and uh, that means that it's very easy for me as a um, writer of an of a application to, to handle those events, and if I'm doing some uh, more, let's call it um, structured, uh, 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 structuring, sorry, of the events, as, as I said before, with some kind of schema validation, there's a very, very clear API. So the way the data flows is very simple, and the way the, um, uh, the data is structured is consistent. And again, this is very important, so, I can, so we can uh, collect the data and do some smart stuff of that we don't want to do in, in the real-time applications or in the back office applications, or whatever. Or we can't because we don't have all the information in there. So, um, one more thing that we did with the event bus is uh, we actually could connect it. Uh, uh, we used those technologies and we connected uh, the fact that we're using, I didn't write it, but we, we are sending JSON and we use JSON schema to uh, validate those JSON structures. So the events that we send are JSON. You can send Avro, which is a little bit more, uh, uh, let's, let's say, uh, more optimized uh, format. And it's, uh, it's really uh, some kind of a useful uh, well, format to send uh, events in the big data arena. It actually came from, from uh, uh, Hadoop, HDFS. But we selected to go with JSON because we're not running that many, uh, th that much data. And, uh, and our system is native node, if you remember my, my promo. 
So it's very easy for us to send, to send JSON. Uh, if the time comes, we, we can change the format. It's pretty easy. But we take the data in JSON to the event bus and from the, from the event bus to S3, the data store itself, in, S, in JSON. We don't touch it at that point, at that part. And what we do with the JSON schema is we actually automatically generate tables for those events. So we can actually look at those JSON structures as uh, SQL tables. And we'll discuss this in a second, in a minute. So this is how our events look like. Um, the, uh, the structure is, is built in a way that we can uh, do unified, uh, let's call it logic on top of it. So every event that we sent would look like that. It would have an event header and a platform header. Uh, and those fields, and it's actually schema based, so those fields are going to be uh, uh, um, stripped and validated when, when I send the event. But there's a trick. And there's the data section, which is what this event is actually holding. But there's a trick. We, I add headers. So if I have a section of the system, for instance, every user in our system that is uh, and hitting our websites uh, has some IDs that we attach to it. So we added another header that is good for all the systems that are working or the, all the services that are working with uh, web users to attach uh, a unified key to that user. And that allows our system, again, when we look at the data, to do some smart joins between events. So the serving system doesn't care about what the data system uh, would do with it, but it allows it, it, it keeps the, uh, let's, get, let's call it the connectivity between the small parts it sent so it can be joined later. So this header of user ID or page uh, ID that we add, those information allows us to group this data between different uh, uh, events. For instance, I have a page view event and I have a click out event. Those are very important events. And I need to unify them in some kind of a key to know that it was the same user that saw, saw the page and clicked out. We're doing that by doing some uh, unified data. Of course, we can put uh, this data inside the data section, but then, but then we don't have some kind of a consistency across event. This allows us, this trick with headers allows us to look at, a head, at a, an event and we actually don't care what is the specific data this event is sending in the data section. We can actually write a generic code that would look at the header and say, ah, I know this user has a, a user ID and I can join with another, another event that has the user ID because it's the same data given. This is the, this is the practice. Um, this is an example of a, of a JSON schema. This is just a standard format. Uh, and this is the event header uh, example. It's not very beautiful. Uh, we actually wrote additional system uh, to take this uh, small, small, um, uh, small system that takes this uh, code and makes it into a markdown. So it would be useful uh, for somebody that doesn't want to read uh, the schema directly. And it's very easy to, uh, to it actually becomes a documenta automatic documentation of what our uh, event means. Uh, if you take a look, there's a description section and there's the ID and type. And we require or we, we, we push for everybody to write a very uh, specific description for the field because, again, this, the people that would write the, this event as a producer uh, in the application probably or might not be the people that read it uh, in the data section. And this uh, unified schema allows us to uh, create, again, an API and a unified uh, knowledge place for what it means. Uh, and it's, it's very, you know, you write something like ID, it doesn't mean it's a unique ID. It's not, it doesn't mean it's a it's a GUI, so here we, we have the format and a specific description because exactly what it is. Okay, let's talk about the data lake. So this is the second part of the data platform. Okay, the first part was the event bus and uh, the event schema and all the event sending mechanisms. The second part is the data lake, which is uh, the main, uh, the, let's say, the, the main part of the, of the data platform. Uh, if you've got the data there, and we put the events in it. Uh, 
and this is, by the way, part of the mechanisms that we are when we build the events. These are the main components you need. You need a data store. You need some kind of a processing engine. You need uh, and a processing engine with some kind of a, and let's call it advanced pluggability, OK? You want to be able to write your own code in, in, into it. And of course, you want to schedule it and make, make some uh, workflow uh, management on top of it. You need a meta store. So a dictionary that will tell you where is everything. Uh, you have a lot of data, where is everything uh, situated? And uh, th this meta store is actually part of the mechanism that allows uh, other mechanisms like the access mechanisms, uh, the APIs, to get to the data. Um, and I think you can, you can think about uh, a data lake like uh, a big um, database that was split into its core parts. So every database, you think about it, has a data store, it's the file system, okay? It has a meta store, okay? Uh, that's the place where the table definition is, is kept. It has uh, an API, the SQL uh, drivers and, and, and engine, and uh, the, the, the there's an additional part which is doing the processing, which is taking the SQL and allows you to uh, allows the optimize it and, and all of that. It actually runs the the queries themselves. It's some kind of a processing engine. It's built specifically for for SQL. So a database is as a as a bulked uh, uh, mechanism that uh, that is doing everything in a, in a hidden fashion from you. A data lake is actually those same mechanisms with a little bit of, uh, let's call it upgrades uh, of one, infinite scale, because you're running it on a distributed uh, a scalable data store and you're running it with a processing engine which itself is distributed. And uh, with, and with pluggable, again, pluggable part, those, since those parts are pluggable, it allows you to, to get this, uh, uh, infinite scale. So, but with, you know, with this power, there's also, of course, limitations. It's not a database because usually what you do uh, with this infrastructure is handle big amounts of data and read a lot of data and write a lot of data. And usually you wouldn't get, uh, let's call it milliseconds uh, access patterns, although uh, there's, there are mechanisms that solve those problems as well on top of Let's call it basic data lake technology. Um, and what's more interesting about a data lake, and I, I find it uh, very important, is the fact that you can access the data not only in an SQL fashion. So you can write code that is running directly on the data, and you have processing engines like Spark that allows you to do that. Uh, that again in a Regular database, the only way to do that is write stored procedures, and we all love that. Uh, but the fact is that it's not running inside the database. It's running in a processing engine, and, and I can set up any number of processing engines. It's every, since all of those parts are decoupled, I can, do, I can run two processing engines. I can run four. I can run 100 on top of the same platform with the same meta store and all of that. Um, so what you, have, uh, what you have here is a little bit, uh, let's call it uh, diving into the structure of a, of a scalable, scalable data store. Uh, you can see um, that I added on the, on the right, sorry, on the left, I added another section because what, what, what's here, the data lake processing is actually a bunch of mechanisms that allows us to take events as, as they come in and start building uh, the enriched data. Okay, I want to close visit. I want to connect, connect conversions into uh, and clickouts into campaigns. All of that I can do with standard ETLs, extract transform load mechanisms that I'm running on top of Spark and all of those uh, heavy lifting mechanisms. But I still want to allow other people that are not, let's call it touching the core uh, data layers uh, of the company, those this section in the, in the in the middle here, uh, I would like to allow anybody to write uh, its own code on top of those uh, 
of the data I collected. So the other part here on the left, the data processing ops is actually parallel to the data like processing. As I said, I can run two engines or n engines on top of the same uh, data stores inside the same data lake, but just showing that we can, I, I split it in to show that there's some stuff are core and we, uh, we let's say we touch them with, with care. For instance, we build only uh, one logical visit. Okay, what is a visit? Uh, but some other application needs to do some other stuff and they're free to do that with the same basic uh, technology stuff. So the data layers itself, that it's the, the middle uh, here is, as I said, we're putting the events in and then we're processing them and doing some enrichments and collect, for instance, data from dimensions and data from, uh, from partners and building layers, I call it data layers, of enriched data. And all of that data is collected and stored in the data store, mapped into tables using the, the meta store and it's accessible through the access layers, which some of them are uh, uh, SQL. And when we do that, it's important to note that uh, I discussed partitioning and formatting at the beginning. We do it in a way, as I told you, the events are themselves are coming in as JSON, but later the data is coming in as, uh, as other file formats that are more uh, suitable for uh, big data. We're, we're using Parquet. We can, we can also use ORC. And we split the data, we're partitioning it. Again, it's not a database. Remember that we don't have indexes here. Um, so we partition the data and it's part of the way we access it in a, uh, in a way that will allow us uh, not go through everything every time we need to, uh, to do something because we're partitioning it by time or any other way we need to partition the data. It's mainly by time, the, the basic stuff. So the processing engines, as I said, those two on the sides allows us to run the core uh, flow of processing and uh, each one of them is actually uh, using the same technology and it's, it's about uh, taking the data, working with it and putting it back usually into uh, into the same data lake. Uh, sometimes it, we, we, we push it out. There's a bunch of mechanism I didn't put in the way we, we, put, we push data out. But basically, uh, we need to schedule those mechanisms. We need to do some checkpoint mechanism for that. We need to monitor that. Uh, all of that is, is the basic stuff that we've built for supporting it. And sometimes we need to take the data at the Bottom left, we need to take the data and put it in external databases. Uh, and, uh, and for instance, to allow visualizations, we, we're using Redshift and, and uh, Tableau for our users. So we take the data sometimes uh, and extract it and put it in, uh, in, in Tableau and in Redshift, Redshift for our analysts and business users to take a look at it. Um, the meta store itself. Okay, it's just it's just a place where we uh, we keep our um, let's call it standardized uh, business uh, structures, which we define as tables. So it's a um, table definition store, and uh, a data lake table definition store is very very similar to a, a table definition store of a database with a bunch of small uh, differences. The big one. One is that's pointing to the location in the disk. In this place, in this space, it's going to be S3 that the data is seeded. Uh, we're using uh, the, the de facto standard in, in big data today is Hive Metastore. We're using Glue, which has the Hive APIs uh, in order to uh, in order to access the data, to allow as SQL access to the data. It also allows us to access the data. Glue itself has an API. We also use this API in order to access or to know how to access S3 objects directly, not just by SQL. Okay, so the data I mentioned, um, this is the place where we keep the data and, and enrich it. Data accessibility is the way we access uh, the, everything that we put in the, in the data store. Uh, the thing is, 
Uh, there's a couple of things uh, to say about it, but I think the most important one is that basically you would need some kind of a, a SQL access button to uh, your uh, data store. It's going to be the easiest way to applications and uh, people to access this data. And this is the way we went about it. There's, of course, applications which are doing smarter stuff might use this meta store, as I mentioned before, to access the data directly if they need to. There's a bunch of use cases where it's correct. But generally speaking, if you want to allow access in a standardized way, SQL is, is the way to go. And you have a bunch of ways to do that. So you can use Athena, which is a presto managed version of, of AWS. And it's an SQL uh, and processing engine. Um, you can use uh, um, things like uh, Zeppelin, Apache Zeppelin, or Jupyter, which is uh, which are uh, notebooks that allows you to run SQL, uh, and they're actually doing uh, something very similar to access the data. They're using the MetaStore again. All of those systems are going to use the MetaStore as the host of their uh, table information. Um, Let's me see. Okay. Okay. So now we're gonna we're, we're nearing the end. Uh, took me a little bit more than I thought. This is a, I threw in all the bunch or most of the tech we're using here. You can see at the top we're using uh, we're actually using Kafka Kinesis data streams and Kinesis Firehose. Where where I wouldn't go into that, but where we have we have multi-region concerns and. We're writing, we want to write locally to an event bus and then think, think it to a remote event bus. So it's actually two event bus. One of them is in those areas and the other one is in this area and they're connected. Um, the meta store we're using is Glue, as I said. We're using Athena a lot and sometimes Redshift and Redshift Spectrum, which allows, again, same as Athena, run queries on top of S3, SQL queries on top of S3. We're using JSON as Parquet as our file format. And Spark over EMR is our main processing engine. And, and we're, we're starting to do some uh, Kubernetes integration into this environment in order to run Python for our data science teams. Uh, and on, on top of that, and of course, we're scheduling it with Airflow. Um, we're doing some, a bunch of, of work with Lambda in order to do some partitioning and, and monitoring and, and cleanups. And we're using Elasticsearch in order to allow fast access to the, to the events we're sending into the system. Um, so that's basically it. Um, let me sum up. This is where now you can start writing some questions. Uh, if you want us to ask, answer, we'll, we don't have a lot of time, but we will answer a couple of questions. Um, worry about your events flowing and, and the way you send the data using an event bus is very important. Don't, don't mess with that. Uh, think about the events themselves, the structure. So JSON or Avro, the file format, think about the schema. Okay, it's very important to, to, to understand that this, this is a contract. The producer applications, and the consuming applications have a contract and there's a bunch of uh, rules to follow, especially about uh, backward compatibility when you send this kind of data. Remember that your data is kept in the system for maybe years and you still need to read it a year. So if an application, if an application changes the events in a, let's call it in, in a non-backward compatible fashion, things would, would be very hard to manage. The data lake itself, Metastore, um, distributed object store, processing engine, SQL engine, scheduling engines. Uh, and again, think about your data standardization. How does the tables look like? What data do you need business-wise? And make sure you have uh, SQL and API access to all of that. Okay, let's see if you guys have some questions. So we have several questions from the audience. Uh, we got uh, two questions about the scale and uh, number of events per hour, bytes per hour. So as I, um, I mentioned it, we're, we're running uh, um, 
we're running about I don't remember the numbers, but it's a uh, it's a low uh, uh, low number of events. If you're, if you're looking about, uh, uh, let's call it uh, uh, in the, in the millions, uh, on the tens of millions per uh, per month. Okay, uh, but and this is why we allowed ourselves to work, to to use JSON directly and not uh, convert it into uh, more advanced uh, formats like Avro, but when you use something like Kinesis or Kafka, uh, there's really a small, let's call it, uh, especially with Kafka, a small problem of scale. I actually run, and actually Chaya came from the same company I used to work with. Well, we, we ran a billion events, almost two billion events per day, it's like a million events per second, some crazy numbers. And Kafka on a, on a Kafka cluster that with six machines that or eight machines that held it. Uh, so scale, on our case, is not big. On my with my experience, those event bus and it's important to use those kind of technologies, not a, not a regular message bus, not a, let's call it probably a Rabbit and Q. Probably those Rabbit and Q and JMS, all of those would work uh, with way 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 lower scale. But we have they have different concerns and different semantics of messaging. Kafka, as I said, is a, is a distributed write-ahead log. It's, it's all it's doing. It's taking the data, putting it into disk, and allow a reader to read it. And it's, I'm saying all, oh, but it's, it's fantastic. And it handles scale in, a, in ways that are amazing. Um, did I miss anything? Uh, no. OK, so what's the next one? So we have another question about the immutability of the data. Um, so the data is immutable, but at the same time you have operations um, and data processing that mutating the data. So how do you track these changes? So actually this is exactly what I'm going to talk about in the next session. Um, basically, Amichai mentioned it, that we are using the Metastore. We actually write the new data to a new location, so it's immutable. And only after we finish writing the data, because the S3 is eventually consistent, we point the, per, uh, the partition from the meta store to the, new, to the new location of the data. So only when the data uh, has been written, the consumers of the data see the new version of the data, and we will talk about it in the next session uh, in detail. Okay. Amichai, do you want to? Uh, no. Okay. So we have another question. Uh, another question: uh, If we process uh, just in large batches, streaming both. So we do. We do only batch for now. Uh, we actually, when we decided, we, we we started building the system. We consider going uh, streaming uh, from day one, and uh, we realized that again, uh, streaming holds uh, with it comes with a bunch of. Uh, let's call it uh, concerns of its own. And we realized it's gonna be very or easier for us to handle the use cases, the business use cases that we need to handle uh, with a batch technology. Having said that, I didn't go into that, but the data platform is extendable to a streaming solution. And we actually had some POCs on, on that. We're, we're, for the way to do it is to put the streaming mechanism below the Kafka and like read directly from the Kafka and then you can do some stuff pretty fast when the data comes in. It could, it could be seconds uh, between a, a producer generates an event and the system doing some stuff. Um, but for our use cases, batch was perfect. We, and and even, even in cases, I can tell you that even in cases when you need, if you can allow yourself a delay of about 30 minutes to an hour, okay, you don't need to think in, about even less, even 20 minutes, you don't think, need to think about streaming. Uh, you, can, you can just use batch technologies to do all of that. When you go below that, I would advise looking into streaming technologies and there's a, there's a lot, lot of, uh, again, differences in the, in the way you uh, access those uh, the streaming versus uh, batches. Although, by the way, it's sold as the same thing, it's not. <laughs> Okay, what we have next? So how do you know that there is no data loss and, and the data is fresh? 
Um, well, that's that's a that's a that's a, an interesting one. Um, we don't. Okay. Uh, you can uh, add. It depends. Let's say it this way. The more let's call it restrictions you put on the event flow, like you want to put ox and and. And there was a question about that. Uh, uh, you can put ax on when you write to Kafka. So you make sure you wrote the data to Kafka. You can put uh, multiple uh, event bus in place. So like you have redundancies on the event bus, you can make sure you teach your, uh, uh, you're sending the data. You can make sure you can do some kind of other buffering mechanism. Uh, we don't do most, we do some small buffering in memory, but uh, uh, we're not doing all of the other stuff yet. Uh, but still, I can tell you again from experience that the amount of data that gets lost, it's not zero, but it's, uh, it's not, it's, it's funny, but it's not very different from working with a transactional database when you save data to it. And I, I can't really explain it, maybe because when there's a problem, it's usually a technical problem, some problems in the network, some problem in the, in the, Kafka itself, as I said, or Kinesis, which are very, very, um, let's call it simple systems comparing to a database. Think about the trans a transaction that happens in a database versus uh, a Kafka event bus, that all it needs to do, take the data, the, this specific message that he got, and put it into this. And they're doing it in an extremely uh, uh, optimized fashion. Um, so what I saw from my experience is you lose very, very little data, uh, and you can add a bunch of mechanisms to make sure that you're not losing on the way. Uh, the more, let's call it important the data you have, the more mechanism you probably should put in place, retries, buffers, arcs, all of that. And we don't have it right now, but uh, there are additional monitoring mechanisms that you can put in place to make sure that your events, and again, I did it uh, in the past, it's very complex. It's, it's making some, adding some headers. Remember those headers I said about the events? You can add headers that allows you to make sure that bulks uh, of data are, are derived completely. So you can head, add counters into, into headers of the events and you can count them. And then you can see that you, if you've lost data, uh, you can you can you can know that you have lost data, and you can do all of that. It's pretty complex to build those uh, additional monitoring systems, and um, I, I guess eventually we're going to get there. Well, we're not there yet. Um, okay. So another one about which tool do you use for interactive analytics? How scalable is it? Um, What we're, what we're doing now is we wrote uh, a basic mechanism that takes the data and push it into Elastic. And uh, so every event, I'm talking about events right now. Okay, there's different parts to the systems here. The part that, that events uh, flow in and uh, are put into S3 and the parts that of the ETLs that are running and generating uh, parquet uh, files. For the events part, we're just taking this data and pushing it into Elastic and, and, and putting on top of it Kibana. You can get all of that pretty easily in, in Amazon managed uh, service. So all you need to worry is every, every time an event or a bunch of events comes in, we do it every five minutes. We, we take the bulk of events, we push it into Elastic and we have uh, in, in gaps of about five, six minutes, uh, uh, all the data uh, that we push into the system as events. And uh, using Kibana for that is, allows us to do uh, pretty easy uh, monitoring and alerts and uh, validation. We added validation mechanisms, so we're doing some uh, schema validation on that part and we track errors and events in that fashion. Okay. Do we have anything else? And we have a question about how looks a machine learning flow from gathering the data until it goes to production using the data lake approach. So I think a VM is going to talk about a framework that we developed that 
uh, data scientists can develop um, uh, machine learning, learning flows without having to concern about the, the, about the deployment and all, of, and all of that. So Aviam will talk about it more in his session. You are welcome to join. Um, so uh, another question if we, uh, is about uh, exactly one set processing uh, in Kafka. So uh, don't do that. You can. Kafka kind of says that it, it can do it, but if I remember correctly, it needs to have only a single producer uh, for the exactly ones that Kafka needs to. Uh, again, in our use cases, remember wh wh what I was talking about is usually data applications that go over a bunch, a, a big bunch of data, and, and I have a, a unique identifier for every event, and I have a bunch of, of primary keys I can, I can uh, use to uh, just dedupe the data when I read it. So it's very hard to do an exactly once uh, processing in Kafka, and we, and we just didn't, we did, we didn't bother. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the last one, right? Or the couple of last one? Uh, uh, yeah, we have a question about Airflow. I don't think it's the scope of this uh, session. Yeah, again, we're, we're, I'm going to say that we're managing, yes, we're managing Airflow ourselves. We're, we're running it in, in Kubernetes clusters and we're doing it ourselves or with the help of our DevOps teams. and. Uh, it's it's actually interesting. Uh, I thought about it when I when I wrote uh, the presentation that there's a lot of lot of managed solutions that we use here, like Athena and the EMR and uh, uh, you name it. A lot of stuff which are uh, and and I didn't didn't think about Airflow. We actually didn't see any um, managed solution for Airflow. So I might be probably there is out there, but well, we're not, uh, we didn't use it. Um, I would say about, generally about managed solutions that I, my approach to that is very, uh, let's call it uh, simple. Use a managed non-open source, oh sorry, a managed open source solution, that's the best way to go because you're getting the open source, uh, let's call it openness. So you can run it on your machine, you can run it, run it on a different cloud uh, and and since it's managed, you're uh, getting a, a, a lot of load off your head, off your back, uh, if you will, uh, to, uh, that you don't need to worry about. So in some cases we use, uh, of course, AWS managed solutions or non-proprietary uh, uh, solutions, sorry, proprietary solutions. But uh, generally speaking, look at what I said. We're, we're doing SQL, we're doing JSON. We're doing uh, Spark, we're doing uh, actually Hadoop. S3 is proprietary, but S3 is actually supported like everywhere. And it's seamless to go between HDFS and S3, almost by the way, <laughs> not exactly seamless. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, thank you very much guys. And uh, next week, Monday, Kaya is going to dive into uh, some of those questions that you just asked. And uh, we're going to have a couple of very, very interesting uh, follow-up webinars uh, showing, showing you how we handled the uh, uh, first, Kaya, how we handled uh, the, let's, call, let's call it the challenges of, of building this data platform, this data lake. Then we're going to dive into how to allow uh, users to do advanced stuff like data scientists and uh, other uh, uh, engineers to easily deploy ETLs without uh, the, the big hustle of you know Spark clusters and all of that, and and, and writing uh, yeah, actually writing big amount of code. And at the end, and in uh, three weeks, we're going to dive into the dark areas of of the let's call it of uh, of data. How do you handle uh, all all of the advanced formats that processing, uh, sorry, that applications would throw at you sometimes and you need to handle it. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye.